This video investigates the paths taken by light as it follows circular geodesics in the equatorial plane around a Schwarzschild mass. <coughs> it utilizes the magnitude of the velocity 4 vector to derive other equations that govern the shape of the orbit and other characteristics such as energy and angular momentum. It then uses these to locate and determine the stability of these orbits. So here we are, our Schwarzschild mass, m, and we have a photon in a circular orbit, and it's the nature of these circular orbits, where they are, how stable they are, that we want to find. Now notice that the magnitude, the magnitude of the four velocity squared is zero for photons, for massless particles. And notice too that the tangent vector here, it is parallel transported around the path that the photon takes. And that is, that is why this path is a geodesic. It parallel transports its own tangent vectors. And, and for a massless particle, the magnitude squared of the four velocity is zero. <coughs> so let's go. All right. Now, massless particles such as photons follow null geodesics, which means we must have for the square of the magnitude of the four velocity, square of the magnitude of the four velocity, this object here, it must be zero. Uh, and so this object is achieved by contracting on the four velocity vector components. And the metric does that, lowers the index on the first one here, or the other one, to give this object here. And the tangent vector I mentioned earlier, dx nu d lambda is the four, uh, represents the four velocity components, dx nu d lambda, and the metric reducing the components on one of these, reducing the index sorry, on one of these, so that this object can be contracted to give us a scalar, and that must be zero. So that in the Schwarzschild geometry we have, for the four velocity squared, this object here, okay, and we can rewrite that because g00 in the Schwarzschild metric is this term here, G11 is this one, G22 is this object here, and G33 is R squared sine squared theta here. All right, so that's writing out the four velocity in general, and we know that's set to zero. <coughs> Next bit. Now we cannot use proper time to parameterize the path of a photon, so we choose some other, any other affine parameter, and we'll just call that lambda, this one. We can't, we can't use the proper time. The path taken by light, ds squared is zero, and that's equal to minus c squared d tau squared, so d tau squared is zero. Now, for circular motion in the equatorial plane, theta is pi on two and d theta is zero. When we do that, the previous equation of motion we saw on the previous slide reduces to this. This object here is equal to zero. Now, in a previous video, we derived the killing vectors and we noticed that, that in the previous videos, when we were talking about particles with mass, we had e squared on m0 squared, m0, m subscript 0 being the mass of the particle. And you notice that's absent here. And the same here for the angular momentum, we had l squared on m0 squared here. And now, for massless particles, it doesn't make sense to talk in terms of the energy per unit mass, or the angular momentum per unit mass as we did with massive particles. What we can do though, is we can think of this as being e squared on m0 squared in the limit as m subscript zero goes to zero. So in the limit as the mass of a massive particle goes to zero, this combination of e squared on m0 squared remains finite in the limit as it goes to zero. Throughout the process in going to zero, this quantity still remains finite. So we can think of it for massless particles, remove the m here, remove the m here, but we can think of this as in, in the limit as the m goes to zero. And so we keep the same expressions here for the energy of the particle and the angular momentum of the particle. And just bear in mind now we're talking about light. Now light has energy and light has angular momentum. Not just spin angular momentum, but it also has orbital angular momentum, which is what we're referring to here. <laughs> Now, our equation of motion then undergoes the following steps. So here we are, we put in the um, killing vector we found, the relationship here, for d lambda, uh, um, dt d lambda, sorry, and over here, dr d lambda, and so on. OK, 
Okay, the next step will be to multiply through by this bit here in the parentheses. When we do that, we get this object here, that one, and then just rearrange it. Let's put the energy term on the left here, on the right hand side here, and this gives us our equation of motion. So when I talk about the equation of motion, I'm referring to this one, or possibly some variant of it too. Now using the chain rule, dr d lambda is dr d phi times d phi d lambda, because we're interested in getting ultimately an equation of motion in terms of phi and r. So dr d phi d phi d lambda, well, dr d phi, we're not sure what that is yet, but d phi d lambda we found from the previous page with the one of the killing vectors in relation to angular momentum, and we found that was L on r squared for d phi d lambda. So let's keep going, and we'll substitute that into our equation of motion here. It gives us this, and then let's just separate these out. The r d phi here times L squared on R to the power of 4 through here. Now let's multiply through by the reciprocal of L squared on R to the power of 4. And that gives us this object here. There we are. <coughs> okay, and just expand this out a bit. The r d phi L squared plus this. So it gives us this object here. We'll do a few more things to it. Okay, now let's make the substitution because we're heading now for the orbit equation. We want to find out about the orbits of photons around a Schwarzschild mass. So we're going to do R, substitute for R, 1 on U. <coughs> dr d phi now is dr du times du d phi. And when we do that substitution, we find that dr du, if we do dr du here, we'll get minus 1 on U squared times then du d phi. And let's substitute that into our equation of motion. So replacing all the R's with this one on U business. Here we go there. Um, now, let's deal with this, square this out. Here we go. And then multiply through by U to the power of 4. We need this object here. Next bit. Now we're going to differentiate both sides with respect to phi. So dd phi, dd phi, and then divide through by some terms. So here we go, d d phi of this object here, d d phi of that, well on the right there they're all constants so they'll go to zero. And then on the left here we'll use the chain rule, so we have 2 times d u d phi times d t u d phi squared and <coughs> plus 2 u d u d phi minus uh, 60 m on c squared u squared times d u d phi is zero. What we're going to do is divide through by 2 Right, and then also we're going to divide through by du d phi. And when we do that, this common factor of 2 du d phi, 2 du d phi, and then here du d phi disappears. And we're left with the equation that governs the shape of the orbit. So the orbit equation, this one here. And now this is for light, for massless particles. This is the equation that massless particles will follow. Now for circular motion, r is constant, so u will be constant, and this derivative will disappear um, because dr d lambda equal to d2 dr d lambda, the second derivative of r with respect to lambda will be zero. Both those will be zero for circular motion because the radial value doesn't change. But that also means that u is constant. So in this equation, it will substitute in here, well, on the next page, You'll see this bit disappears and we'll have to just u equals this object here for u constant because if u is constant, obviously dis the second derivative disappears. And that gives us this object here and then divide through by u. And then let's substitute the r back in, one over r here, solve for r, the radial coordinate, and we get 3 gm on c squared. And that tells us there is only one circular orbit in the Schwarzschild geometry, only one at this value here. And for circular motion, dr d lambda is zero. And so coming back to our energy equation, the equation of motion here, that will disappear. And we're left with this object here, which will give us some information about angular momentum. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the last equation can be solved for the angular momentum of the photon. So we've got this object here is equal to e squared on c squared. Rearranging that, um, multiplying this by the reciprocal on the left here, and we get this object, then take the square root of both sides, we get this object here. If we substitute this into our equation of motion, which happens right there, we've got this object, and then tidy this up a bit. Here we 
these constants here, this object here is that. And then what we can do is this business in here can be expressed as the effective potential. So our equation of motion becomes the R divided all squared plus the effective potential is equal to these constants here related to the energy. So as you expect for an orbit, kinetic potential and total energy. All right, next bit. So the effective potential is this object here. And we can locate where the um, orbits occur, circular orbits occur. So a minimum occurs at dv effective dr is zero um, <coughs> or a maximum. And we find that um, when we take the derivative of the effective potential with respect to the radial coordinate, that's this object in here. All right. And then we set that equal to zero here. We solve it, these steps here, gives us this value here. So this is where the turning point occurs. Uh, I've written minimum here, but it could be a maximum. And we'll see that it is actually. And here is where our turning point occurs at this one value only. All right. The second derivative of the effective potential will tell us if the orbit is stable. So the second derivative of the effective potential is this object here. And then we need to evaluate that at the value we've just found. So if the second derivative is negative when evaluated the given orbital radius, then that orbit is unstable. So we evaluate this at that value there. That's the single orbit we found located by the first derivative. And when we do that, we get a negative value here. So that tells us that this is an unstable orbit. <coughs> and we'll see with the plot shortly. So we'll rescale our plot. The effective potential, c squared times the effective potential over 27, versus c squared r on gm. And when we do that, we'll produce an expression like this. And the only other term besides the r's that are in there is this e squared. And now we'll plot it for four different values of e. e is 1, 2, 3, 4, just to give you a sense of what the effective potential plot looks like for, for different values of the energy of the photon. Okay, here we go. So here's our plot. Notice the maximums are all at that 3 gm on c squared for the different energies of the photons. E is 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right. uh, here, the Schwarzschild radius here is 2 gm on c squared, right here. Okay, And notice the maximum at r equals 3 gm on c squared for each value of the energy of the photon. These are the maximums, and so unstable orbit points. Now, a plot of the effective potential versus radius for an object of the mass of the Sun, and that mass is all contained within its Schwarzschild radius, and we've chosen for the energy of the photon E as 1. Uh, when we plot that, we get this one here. There's our maximum, 3 gm on C squared, um, our unstable uh, orbit. And what we found is that there are no stable circular orbits for photons in the Schwarzschild geometry. None. There is one unstable orbit, and that's a 3gm on c squared.